There's, there's a famous scholar named Jennifer Jenkins, and she's very, very good. She works in pronunciation and promoting the teaching of pronunciation. And the things that she talks about, I find myself in great agreement with, but there's a problem where we really split, a place where we really split. Right now, there's a tendency towards English as a lingua franca. Everybody know what a lingua franca is? Lingua franca. Some of you know. What's a lingua franca? Yeah, you can call it a yu. It's a language people have in common. It is not the language of either party in many cases. It's not my native language, it's not your native language, but because you don't speak Mandarin and I don't speak Farsi, we communicate in English. And what this movement says, and it's very true, that more and more English does not just exclusively belong to native speakers, right? English is a part of the life of practically everybody in the world now because it's the means that we use to communicate when we don't have a shared, another shared foreign language. For foreigners in Taiwan, our lingua franca tends to be English, but very often it's Mandarin because we're in a Mandarin-speaking environment. Not everybody likes speaking English. So for a lot of my foreign friends, our lingua franca is Mandarin. But, and that might, in the future, there might be a tendency for Mandarin to become a lingua franca with the, with the rise of China now. But for now, English is definitely the world lingua franca. And their idea is that we do not need to be so picky about training in any one particular English accent. And also, you can't learn everything well, so you just should learn some main points well. We need to prioritize. That means you spend more time, for example, on distinguishing vowels clearly, but we don't have to be picky about th. If you say if you want if you say one two three that's okay. Woman Haitinda don't push the We won't we won't push you on that. We'll just concentrate on a few things that really interfere with intelligibility. Um, this is also called English for international communication, and I can't disagree with those parts. We should prioritize. Some things are more important to intelligibility than others. That's true. Another point that. Professor Jenkins said at the end of a talk on YouTube, and I'll put the link up for you, she said, we shouldn't put all the responsibility on the speaker. We should train our listeners to be more aware of and sensitive to the many different accents of English there are in the world. And I totally agree with that. We should also train our listeners. But the place where we split is are we able to train all the listeners that you are going to inter interact with in the future? Are we able to? No. What happened? What's this? There's too many. There's too many. And how lucky are you that you got in Taida? I mean, you are so lucky. Not just lucky, you worked hard for it. However, you are very privileged, we'll say it that way. Not that many people can come to Taida or the better universities in Taiwan. They're not going to get that kind of training. And many people don't go to a university at all. But you may have to interact with them. You need to, you need to get your kitchen remodeled. Or you need, to do, uh, you need to conduct a transaction at the bank, or whatever it is. You need, to, you, you need to interact with many different people. We can't train all your listeners. And the problem is that if you are only concentrating on minimal intelligibility, but you still have a very strong accent, what does our brain do? When you first see somebody, what do we say? You know, do you judge them immediately? I mean, your first, your first reaction to somebody, we call that a first impression, right? Does that tend to stay with you for a long time, or do you forget about it and change it as you go along? That first impression you have of somebody. It stays with you forever, doesn't it? If somebody, the very first thing when you met them, they said something really rude. That's the first impression you have of him or her. You're probably going to always be kind of careful around that person. That's a rude person, right? So first impressions really make a difference. 
And pronunciation is like your manmin. If your pronunciation is not clear, if it's not fluent and confident, and if it's sometimes here and sometimes there and hard to interpret sometimes, that person is just going to have an impression of you. That's somebody who it's very tiring to talk to. And this brings us to a book that's really popular right now. I heard an interview about it this morning on Fabia Dantai. I still listen to the radio. I know I'm probably the only one. But it's this book, which is now printed, which has now been published in Chinese translation, called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And if you have Professor Xi Yonghui as a teacher, he's probably already recommended it to you. It's a really wonderful book. I had already seen his TED Talk. And I had already liked him on Facebook and forgot about it. And then Professor Shi reminded me of him and then this book. And I got it immediately at Eslete. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And I recommend it to all of you because it tells us how our brains work. It's things that we actually know, but we hadn't really had them confirmed in a book and systematized. And he cites lots of research that shows how our brains work. Basically, we have two systems. And that's what I've been talking to you about all this time. I tell you, your front brain and your back brain, right? Your slow thinking brain and then your automatic brain. Everybody remember that from class? Yeah? And I say when you learn language, you have to keep repeating until it becomes automatic, right? So he talks all about that in very concrete terms, how that works. And the way our brains normally work, in short, is whenever we're confronted with a new situation, we make a snap judgment, a lightning fast judgment. We judge immediately what we think of it and what we're going to do. Now, snap judgment in English is sometimes a negative term. That means you're too quick to judge without getting the facts first. But your automatic brain just has a big collection of all of your experiences in life, all the things it thinks is important. It has a judgment of what should be normal, what is normal. And if something looks a little not normal, you're going to react immediately. Something's different today. That's what that part of your brain does. It's very good at pattern recognition. Something doesn't fit the pattern. It reacts. It says, watch out. Something's different. It might be dangerous. So that part of your brain is giving you snap judgments immediately. It will hand over its judgment to the slow thinking brain. And it will ask the slow thinking brain. It doesn't really ask because it's unconscious. We can't really sense that part of our brain. That part of our brain is working very hard, and we don't feel it. It's unconscious. It takes up a lot of energy, and we don't realize it, because it happens without our consciousness. So it makes a very quick decision, hands it over to the slower part of the brain. And the slower part of the brain, if it thinks there's danger, it will think carefully, step by step. Is this dangerous? No, I guess it's different, but it's OK. It will think. But the slow part of the brain really hates to work. It's lazy. It's very, very lazy. You know that when you have a difficult problem in front of you, what do you often do? You close the book, right? <laughs> Go to something else. Or your brain will answer an easier question. The question that you asked me was too difficult. So I'll think of a related question that's easier, and I'll answer that instead. He cites that in the book. OK, this is just background. The point is that this part of your brain is making judgments immediately. As soon as you hear somebody with an accent that's difficult to understand, this part of your brain is going to say, this person is hard to listen to. I don't want to talk to him next time. It's too tiring. Or it may hand the work over to the conscious brain, which has to now work at deciphering everything they're saying. OK, please sit down. This part of the brain says, oh, you guys should sit. So it has to go to 想得很慢的那个部分,然后转换得很慢,很辛苦. That's what's missing from this whole school of thought regarding English as a lingua franca. If you learn English, you may be understood, but the other person may not want to talk to you after a while. And that hurts you, makes you less competitive. You're not going to get anywhere if nobody will talk to you. So I just want to point that out that if you want to get good, you have to get really good. In music, is it OK if you get most of the notes right and some of them wrong? No. Sherry? No. It's not, because what? Is it worth listening to? Are you going to listen to it at all? 
就是有一些音错了，可是大致对了，那种音乐你会听吗 ？No. We 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 demand perfection in music, right? How about in math? 就是大部分对了，有些小错没关系啦。联考会通过吗 ？We demand perfection in math in music. Why do we not demand perfection in language learning? Why is that different? You need to speak it well so people can understand you. The most easily understood accents are the standard accents of the world: British English, American English. If you speak standard Australian and others, those are okay too. If it's a standard, that means a large number of people recognize it, identify with it, understand it easily. So her idea is that RP received pronunciation is a is a dying dialect. Not so many people speak RP anymore, and I've told you that before. Fewer and fewer people. They're middle-aged and older, and they live in the area of London, South England. Many people now speak a somewhat different accent. So, because of that, she believes that RP is not so suitable for teaching twenty-somethings, people your age, because it's it's already old-fashioned. But I had a discussion with my British teacher yesterday about this, and he says, "But it's still the standard. If you want to be understood, that should be your goal." The accent's changing, and you can pick that up when you go to England and you find out some pronunciations are different. Maybe you'll adopt them, and maybe not. But only by aiming for the standard can you be assured that you have really learned the language thoroughly in a way that most people will understand you. So this is where I differ. You will find people who feel strongly about the other side, and you can listen to them and make your own decision. But I just wanted to share that with you. This stuff is really useful. It will help you not just because you want to mimic parrot. Some kind of a, some some kind of abstract standard, but because you want to learn the language thoroughly, you are language majors, you're foreign language majors. You should know as much about language and be aware as much as you can be of what you're doing and of what is involved in language learning, not just 模模糊糊一个印象 So for the people who say one year, one year, the one, where do they get the one? Maybe from Mandarin. 受到国语的影响，可是他根本没有 awareness。没有感觉到 ，n 舌尖需要顶上去。他没有学到，他不知道，他是凭听来的印象，然后学一个他认为大致有点像的。It's really hard on the listener. Okay, this part of the brain says this is tiring. This part of the brain says you're giving me a lot of work. I'm working too hard. All right. So in order for you to be good, to be aware, to really know what you're doing, to be able to teach students well, and so forth and so on, you need this stuff. So everything we're doing in this class, in my opinion, is going to help you further that goal. Okay, that was a long talk. It was after watching this video yesterday. I won't show it now, but I'll put the link up. So this is an assignment. I want you to watch this video by Professor Jennifer Jenkins. I'll put the link up. So put it, put it in your notes. Watch the video. It's only like eight minutes long. It's not long. It's very clear. She does good work, and what she says is true. But I told you exactly where we split. I believe students should learn a standard accent. If they're on their own in Taiwan, it has become an excuse for not learning grammar well, for not learning clear pronunciation, because they'll say, "Well, this is Taiwan English. This is our our variety of world English." It's an excuse, and it is not taking your listener into account. Okay, so "Thinking Fast and Slow" by Daniel Kahneman, highly recommend it. You can get it at at、uh, Esli, and it's also in Chinese. Tian Xia put out the Chinese, and also watch this video by Jennifer Jenkins. And、uh, please think about it. In addition, please consider setting up a study group. You need to go through what is left of this textbook, sentence by sentence. The last two chapters, five that we are just going to finish, and then four, they will be in the final. We're not having separate tests. The tests can kind of teaching you the parts that you didn't learn well enough. Well, you're not going to have that for these chapters because we don't have time. So I highly suggest a study group. Go around in a circle, read it sentence by sentence. Anybody have any questions or feedback? Okay, we're going to continue.、Um, we need to、uh, collect the notes. And in your notes, you should also have taken notes on the three Shida articles plus two web pages, thirty-two and thirty-three. And we're going to assign a new web page in addition to the video I just mentioned by Professor Jenkins. There's going to be a new web page, and you can see it under 1220. Everybody, see it up here. It's web page number 20. Web page 20. You need to look at this, and you need to go to the links. The links will 
uh, contain a lot of important information. It's somewhat about this chapter, more about chapter four. It's about the structure of a syllable, 音节的结构. Now, we haven't even dis defined a syllable because a syllable is really difficult to define. It depends on the language. Okay, have we discussed syllables before? Anybody? What is a syllable? Okay, we're going to discuss it more in another chapter, especially next semester if you hang around. But it's very hard to define a syllable because it it, I know we did mention it a bit. Remember when I asked you how many syllables there are in kantan? Remember? Jiantan has how many syllables? Jiantan has how many syllables? Two, right. But in Japanese, they have the same word. It's a loan from Chinese. Kantan has, has how many syllables? In Japanese. They count it as four, but they don't call them syllables. In English, we call them something else. And I'm going to try to think of it right now. Um, you can count them as four units of time, units, uh, phonological units. So, kan, they're like four beats. Kan, tan. Japanese count the final n as a separate unit. Okay? So, kan, tan, they will count it as four. An English speaker, a Chinese speaker, counts it as two. Right? And in certain languages, they kind of count sh as a separate syllable. The one I can think of is called Bella Coola. It's a Native American language in the northwest of the US. So if it's sh, it's a separate syllable. And some of my students seem to think it's an extra syllable in English. But in English, we don't consider it an extra syllable. It depends on the language. It depends on your perception, your definition of what a syllable is. So on page 20, the web page, it's going to talk to you about <coughs> the structure of a syllable. It's meant to be universal, general, but like I said, every language will have its own definition of what a syllable is. So you need to read page 20, take notes on it, include the notes in your notes for next Monday, okay? Okay, I hope to give you your um, tests very soon. You will need to ding jung them and hand them in, hopefully on Wednesday, but otherwise it will be on Monday. All right, we're going to continue in our textbook. And we will have people read because we still need to get practice. Yeah, I think we're, we're somewhere around 121. Okay? Uh, page 120, mm -hmm. the last paragraph. Yeah. Uh, although one cannot entirely predict which syllable will be the tonic syllable in an international phrase, uh, international phrase, some phrase. general phrase. phrase. Everybody watch that, that Z. Okay. okay. Uh, in an international phrase, some general statements can be made. New information is more likely to receive a tonic accent than materials. Tonic, in American, tonic. Tonic. Mm -hmm. Everyone that O, a lot of O's you will say O, and it's not really wrong. A lot of people actually do say it that way, but in the Midwest it's A, tonic. To receive a tonic accent than materials that has already been then, mentioned. Then what? Then, uh, oh. Uh, the material that has already been mentioned. The topic of a sentence is less likely to receive the tonic accent, accent than the comment that is made on that topic. Okay, stop right there. Um, this is a lot of information and it's more important than it may look. Here he's talking about topic and comment. And I think we've talked about topic and com comment in Chinese, have we? Zongwen, topic, comment, ma. Okay, we talk about it a lot in other classes, like in freshman English, where we do a lot of translation. Um, Chinese is basically SVO, like English, subject, verb, object, or fan. No problem, right? However, what is more important in Chinese has to do with information structure rather than subject, verb, and object. Subject, object, verb, or subject, verb, object. And in Chinese, I think we've mentioned this. The most important information always goes where? Always at the end. In Chinese, the important information always goes at the end. Always. Always. And the head of a phrase that has a modification 
That also comes at the end. So 被修饰的部分也一直都在后面 Like the guy who I saw yesterday in Chinese becomes. 再讲一次。昨天看到的那个人 And by the way, when we say guy or man, 我建议你们不要直接翻成男人 Because when you hear 男人 in Chinese, what do you think? 那个男人 What do you think? 这个人跟这个男人这两句有差别吗 ？What, Sherry? What's the difference? One is male. We know that. But is there any other difference? 那个女人，哇，那个 reaction 就比较强了。When we say 那个女人 ，What's your reaction? I could see it immediately. What is it? It sounds negative, doesn't it? 那个男人好好像没有那么 negative. Okay, for me it can. 男人 ，right? <coughs> we can do it with either sex. 那个男人 in Chinese we normally don't have to say 男 We don't. 那个人就好了 Note that in your translation. 这是翻译课该教的 Because I notice that in most of my students, whenever they see man in English, it becomes 男人 But you don't usually say that in Chinese. You just say 那个人就好了 Because you're not really big on noting what their sex is. 你根本连 he 跟 she 都没有，对不对？男人、女人这两个，它的用法跟一般的跟那个那个人是不一样的。All right, so I just want to mention that.、Um, the point originally was the important information goes at the end, and the head of a phrase goes at the end. That means the part which is modified, 被修饰的那个部分 So the guy I saw yesterday. 英文是变成一个关系代名词子句，对不对 ？The guy who I saw yesterday. We can't really do it any other way. The yesterday by me seen guy, 可以吗 ？The yesterday by me seen guy, 英文可以吗 ？No, we don't do it that way. But that's what you do in Chinese. In other words, all of the modification goes before the verb or for the noun. Also before the verb, if you're modifying a verb. 不管你修饰的是什么，被修饰的东西永远在后面。重要的资讯也永远在后面。The reason we got into this in the first place is the idea of topic and comment. So, in English, we can say, "I've already washed the clothes." I've already washed the clothes. How would you say that in Chinese? Think about that. A good translation that has the same focus as the English sentence. I've already washed the clothes. How would you say it? Right. Some of you have it right. How about 我已经洗过衣服了 or 衣服已经洗好了 Which one do you like better? 第一个，第二个 All right. Now we say that Chinese is subject, verb, object, right? 我已经洗好衣服了 But you like it better when I say 衣服已经洗好了洗好了那英文变成什么？不对，中文变成什么？是 object, subject, verb. 对不对？被洗的东西在前面。So object, subject, verb. 中文是那么严格的 S V O 吗 ？No, but it has nothing to do with subject, object, verb. It has to do with focus, and focus has to do with what is most important and the most most important information. So, in Chinese, rather than saying it's strictly S V O, we usually say that Chinese is a topic. Comment language. This is very important for your translation class for your general linguistic knowledge. Chinese is generally a topic comment language. Topic is that stuff we already know, or is that new information? It's old information. It's stuff we already know. Ifu. That means we all know there's a there's a stack of dirty clothes that need washing. We already know that. And who's gonna who's gonna wash them? Is it me or is it you? Is it somebody else? 啊，衣服这件事情，我们之前谈过这个衣服的问题，我已经洗好了。重点是到底洗了没有？重点永远是在后面。And that is called the 前面衣服 is the topic and 洗好了 is the comment. So this is the way we generally try to analyze Chinese. And this is not about subject verb object. It is about what? Information structure. Information structure. 
putting what's important at the end in the case of Chinese. Topic at the beginning, 已知的部分, stuff that's already shared knowledge, 新的东西, 新鲜的资讯放后面. So that's what he's talking about here. We have it in English too, but because we don't have a strict topic comment rule in English like you do in Chinese, we will do things differently. And I will give you an example. This is basically about translation, but it has a lot to do also with intonation, which we're talking about in this class. This is an example from a story by John Steinbeck we're reading in freshman English called Johnny Bear. And in this story, there's a guy who's living near, who, 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 is, who is at a gongdi, and he needs to find an apartment. If he goes far away to look, he'll get a nice apartment. But if he looks only in the neighborhood, he'll get a really lousy apartment. So he started looking, and he found an apartment very close to the gongdi, to the construction site. But it was very, very what? Very lousy. It was a really lousy apartment. It was dark. It was dirty. It was small. It was not nice. But he decided to rent it anyway, because it was close, and the woman said she would forward his mail to him. So it was convenient, and it was close, so he rented it anyway. And then he said this sentence, after all, I only slept in that dark, dank apartment. Dank After all, I only slept in that dark, dank apartment. Please translate into Chinese. After all, I only slept in that dark, dank apartment. I can see the, see the wheels turning in your brain, so let's see what you come up with. There we go. Okay, Jerome's got it. Some of you came up with something else. What else did some of you come up with? Some of you thought that, right? Is that right? Why is that not a good translation? Can you tell me why? Jerome had a really, Jerome gave us a good translation. Why is that not a good translation? Why don't use Chinese in there? That's a very general answer. Can you be specific? <laughs> That's so general. It doesn't say why. We need to say, yeah. Because the focus are different. The, the, the first sentence is focused on, the general mentions that he is, he focused on I, mentioned I slept uh, in, I slept in somewhere, but in the other sentence, we, he focused on the, 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 the part, the, the room I, Left. Almost, almost. You have you have it half right. Give your translation again, please, John. Okay. You have it half right. Can somebody finish it? Clarify it a bit. Why is that better than? Why? Yeah. Because the first sentence is more important than the second sentence. Yes. Right there. Okay. Because the whole point of it is, it's a lousy apartment, I agree. But the only thing I do there is sleep, so who cares? Right? That's a reason for, for renting or for, for uh, going to a cheaper hotel, right? If you're only going to sleep there, who cares about luxury? You're just going to sleep. So that's topic, information, that's really important, comes at the end. And that's very relevant to what we're doing. Now, in English, we didn't do that. In Chinese, you, are, you have a very, very reliable tool for making the other person know what is important. You always put it at the end. It's a very yenge, so don't let anybody tell you Chinese has no grammar. This is a yenge. It's based on information structure to a great extent. But we don't do that in English. So how do we let the other person know that the important thing is it's only for sleeping, so who cares? We put it in the middle of the sentence. So how can the listener know, like you would know in Chinese because it's at the end, how can the listener to the English know what is really important? Right, you got it. 
So what you do in Chinese with word order? 你们是用语序来达到的那个目的。我们说英文的人是用什么东西来达到 ？Stress. This is a very, very, very important lesson. Everybody, make sure it's in your notes, because many people have been studying English for years and decades, and they even may be professional translators, and they still make this mistake. They still have not learned the structure of Chinese. They know English, but they don't know Chinese. At least they don't know its structure. That's why it's really important for you to learn Chinese grammar, because you can't really understand what you're doing in English well unless you know what it corresponds to in Chinese. In Chinese, you use word order. That's grammar. In English, we use stress. So that sentence, when we're reading it, we would say, "After all, I only slept in that dark, dank room. I only slept in that dark, dank room." 所以后面虽然是在尾巴。我们用低频调，完全没有重音，来取消它的重要性，来贬低它的重要性。Okay, this is really, really important, and you're going to see things like this in these sentences. And I want you to think of Chinese equivalents. 你每次看到中间鼓起来的地方 ，you think, well, what would we do in Chinese? And that will often explain in Chinese, 鼓起来的地方可能要放后面了。Okay. Hmm. So it says you can't entirely predict which syllable will be the tonic syllable. We can make some general statements. New information will get the tonic accent. We use tonic accent to mark new important information. And then, if we still put stuff after it, 后面还摆一些东西的话，可能就是用低频调把它敷衍过去了。Okay.、Um, so it says thus: If you're telling someone a number of facts about lions, you might say the sentence shown in four, which says. A lion is a mammal. A lion is a mammal. 就是我们已经知道在谈狮子的事情，然后我要提供一个额外的资讯，就是是哺乳动物。A lion is a mammal. Did you know that? The topic of the discussion is lions, and the comment on that topic is that a lion is a mammal. The two speakers in four differ slightly in that the American English speaker puts accents on both lion and mammal. So when Bruce said it, he said the lion is a mammal. You know, lion. What kind of a word is lion? It's a content word. So of course we are going to stress it. You can also make it flat. If we've been talking about lions a long time, the lion is a mammal. It's not a fish, okay? But if it's just a general statement, we will certainly stress it because it's a content word. So it depends on how old it is. 那个就会决定那个 lion 的重音有多大。Um, nevertheless, even for this speaker, the tonic accent is the last accent of the intonational phrase. For both speakers, this is on the last word "mammal," making it clear that this is the comment, the new information that is being given about an already known topic. The tonic accent goes on the new information, the last content word, the last important content word in the sentence. Okay, and if there are content words after that, then they are probably not important. There's contrastive stress. So, 对比的那种重音 In a discussion of mammals, and considering that all animals that fit into the category, that category, the comment, the new information, is that a lion fits into that category. So, 如果我们谈论的话题是什么？现在反过来，另外一种情况，嗯 ，right? We're talking about what? Mammals. Okay, 我们的话题不是狮子，而是哺乳动物，是 mammals. If that is our topic. Then, talking about a lion, mentioning a lion will be new information. 有很多种哺乳动物，人就是哺乳动物啊。牛就是，猫就是。A lion is a mammal. 哎，狮子有没有想到？狮子也是。Now, of course, we all know that, but just assuming it's really fresh here. A lion is a mammal. A lion is a mammal. Okay, 这个也是哦。So various pitch changes are possible within the tonic accent in sentences one through five. The intonation may be simply described as having a falling contour, except for the continuation rise in the middle of three. Okay, in three, if you go back to three, that means、um, on the previous page.、Um, okay, when we came in, we had dinner. When we came in, okay, they're talking about three here. Another possibility is that the tonic syllable is marked by a low target followed by a rise. 可能会很
很低，然后再往上升。So， 最近我们用的那个 mini conversation 在另外两班。You have tickets to the Elton John concert. You have tickets to the Elton John concert. Where is the tonic stress in that sentence? You have tickets to the Elton John concert. Where is the tonic stress? You got it. All of you seem to have gotten it. Now, concert is higher or lower than the word John? It's higher, and we're used to having stresses high, right? For example, the book is on the table. The book is on the table. It's very high. Now you have tickets to the Elton John concert. Concert goes higher. That is because why? Why is concert higher? It's what kind of a question? A yes/no question. Yes, question. And yes/no questions do what? They go up. So. In a yes/no question, when you're going up, your tonic stress will go low and it will turn back up. That's the 转弯的地方 This is an important thing because Taiwan students generally have a hard time hearing tonic stress in rising intonations. 只要是 yes/no question 往上升的那种音调的话，台湾学生一般很不容易听出 tonic accent 在哪里 And、uh, a friend of mine who I think I've mentioned before, Ou Shuzhen 老师在那个中山大学 She has done extensive research on this. She tested students originally if they could hear a rising tonic accent. Most of them could not. Native speakers could, except one or two. You say native speakers, you can't hear it. We know it, but we may not be able to analyze it. So the Taiwan students mostly could not hear it. 经过几个礼拜的训练之后 they were tested again. How do you think they did? They did better. The training helps. When you know what to look out for, you can learn it. This is a case 训练的 So, in teaching pronunciation, like I said, it's not just forcing you to adopt a certain accent, but you're learning a lot of the principles about how it works. So, we've learned that stresses go high with 肯定句 that go down. The book is on the table. But in a rising intonation, it's going to go low and it's going to turn. It's a turning point. It's a 转弯的地方 There will be a change, and that's true of tonic stresses in general. It always has a change in the tonic. It may be very high, it may be very low, but we've got a change here. And here, it turns the corner and comes back up. You've got, you've got tickets to the Elton John concert, and that's what he's saying here.、Um, okay, it's typical in questions requiring the answer. What? Yes or no. 倒数第四行 on page 121, requiring yes or no is exemplified in six, and we'll read that in a minute. For the British speaker, the first part of the sentence is on a fairly level pitch, with most of the rise on the last word. The American speaker has a rising pitch for much of the last two thirds of the sentence. And here's the example on the next page. Will you mail me my money? And when Bruce read it, he said, "Will you?" Will you? 也可以 Okay, 你你要采取行动也可以 Will you mail me my money? And the British, will you mail me my money? So money, the Elton John concert. Will you mail me my money? There's where the tonic is. It turns around and goes up. Okay, and we will break there. And there are a couple of、um, questions during break. First of all, that word I was blanking out on and trying to remember. In kanpan in Japanese, we don't call each of those units a syllable. We call them amora, M-O-R-A. This is a useful word. It will be, it will appear in the textbook later on, but I think it's in chap in se semester two. So M-O-R-A, mora. That's a unit, a phonological unit that's bigger than a segment, but sometimes it is just a segment, but smaller than a syllable. So kanpan, 那个 n is one mora. 总共是 four more or more s. 这两个复数都有 more s 是拉丁文的复数，比较有比较学术。不过 more 这个字本来就是很学术的字。We also have more s. 现在比较越来越 common 了。So more 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 s. 那是就像日文的那种比较小的，还不到音节的这么长的一个单位。
It counts as a beat. And that goes back to the original question of how do we define a syllable. And it's nearly impossible. So, like I said, every language has its own standards. Even within a language, people will hear things as different lengths. For example, um, fire. How many syllables does fire have? The dictionary tells you one, but how many do you hear? I hear two. Fire. Fire. You got lian, yu, lian. That's two syllables. Or spoil. How many does that have? The dictionary tells you one, but I hear spoil. So the, the, the idea of syllable is very, very fuzzy, and it's really hard to define rigorously. Nobody so far has really succeeded, and they can't because it keeps moving around. The definition keeps moving around. We've always got exceptions. And then in British English, secretary, secretary. How many syllables? Secretary. But secretary, three. There's kind of a half of a syllable there. And we have a lot of that in, English, in American English as well. So family. Is there, is there a half syllable? Is there a real syllable? Is there no syllable? Family, family, family. There may be something in between. So anyway, for this unit smaller than a syllable, at least for Japanese and similar situations, we use the word mora. This is a good manual, you don't need a Alice asked, what's the difference between a segment and a syllable? That's easy. Remember that a segment in Chinese is in tuan. It only means either a vowel or a consonant. For example, t, that's a segment. E is a segment. E is also a syllable, as in e fu. E, it's one segment which happens to also be a syllable. But in the guanian, how are we going to define syllable? I have my definition, and this might be useful to you. It is the subjective sensation of a beat. Yi pai, zhu guan gan dao shi yi pai. The nega dan wei jiu jiao syllable. That's the best definition I can give you. It's a unit of speech that gives you the subjective sensation of one beat. So, impossible, impossible, four beats, four syllables. Now, how do you define beat? Like I said, it's subjective. It's a feeling that it counts as a separate unit in a line. But that's the best definition I can give you. We don't have a really good definition for syllable. So, syllable, India, mora, I don't have a good Chinese translation for this. Does anybody know? It didn't occur to me. Pass it, shall you syllable, diga down way. Sometimes it's a bit shorter, a bit faster. And we use it for languages like Japanese where they count things differently. And segment is in duan. So those are the questions that came up on syllable and segment. Also, accent. This is from a question that Stanley asked during the break. He said, is it good to learn just one accent or more accents? This, I started talking about it when I was talking about Professor Jenkins' video. And this is something I feel strongly. I, be, I believe for speaking, when you're first learning, learn one accent consistently. You can be aware of variations, but for your speech, choose one accent because that will confuse your listener the least. consistent. So for speaking, I really recommend stick to one accent. If you happen to move, like you started out living in New York, and then you move to London, if you move to London, learn a British accent, learn a new one. It doesn't mean you get rid of your old one. You keep that for when you need it, when you go back to America. You speak with people who speak American English. Learn a new one. Add new accents. You will never lose your Taiwan English. It will always be there somewhere. And it's useful sometimes. It's useful. So don't think it's bad and you have to throw it away. You need it for all kinds of situations in Taiwan, communicating with other Taiwanese. You sound like a show-off if you insist on a standard English accent. So every accent has its validity, but some accents are more useful than others. And for your speech, at least in more formal situations when it's required, I suggest you stick with one accent. Learn one accent really well. Stick with it. Then, if you need another accent, learn another accent and learn that one well and stick with that when you're in that situation that requires it. That's speaking. Listening is a totally different matter. Listening is entirely different. 
When it comes to listening, we now do live in an international world. And this is where Professor Jenkins is absolutely right. We, we live in an international world that largely relies on English to communicate, which means we'll have many, many different kinds of English out there. You should try to speak one clear variety, but when you're listening, be ready for absolutely anything. Okay? You should be ready for Indian English. You will hear it quite often, right? So, you need to get used to it. South African English, Singaporean English, wherever it is, accustom yourself to it. Listen to all kinds of different kinds of English, get used to them, and be able to listen to them comfortably and understand them. As language majors, you should be doing that. For listening, you should be, you should be om omnivorous. Omnivorous means everything is okay. I mean, for listening. Speaking and listening is two different matters. And um, Stanley gave the example. He said that someone he said was fired for having a British accent in, in, in American media. I find that hard to believe. Maybe there was another reason they fired her. I don't know what the story was. But in fact, in America, we do listen to lots of accents in the media. They have a lot of British accents, for example, on CNN and the other TV stations. So for listening, absolutely, you need to be able to um, understand any kind of an accent. You need to train yourself. And don't just complain. Get used to it. Just learn it. OK? Adjust. Let's go back to the textbook, and let's just try to finish up chapter 5. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go over a couple of things, because I don't think they have I mean, the content is not that dense. So I'm going to go over a couple, and then I'll call on you when we get to a chapter I want you to, I'm sorry, a paragraph I want you to read. So on page 122, we just talked about, will you mail me my money? And we were talking about the tonic accent or tonic stress in what kind of a sentence? Yes, no questions when we have what kind of intonation? Rising or falling? That's right. When we have a rising intonation, remember, the tonic accent will go lower and it will turn a corner. It's a pivotal point. Wait, John, why? Um, and it says, now consider what you do in questions that cannot be answered by yes or no, such as that in eight. Well, no, here we have seven. We didn't cover that. Will you mail me my money? It's OK, let's go over that first. Um, as with falling contours, the syllable that has prominent rising contour is not necessarily the last stress syllable in an intonational phrase. If the question in six is really about whether the money will be mailed or whether it has to be picked up, that in, then that emphasis will be on an earlier word. And the pitch will start going up at that point. So the emphasis will be on an earlier word. And as soon as you've turned the corner on that turning point, it will keep going up. But we've already passed the tonic stress. So don't think just because it's higher, it has the tonic stress. That tonic stress has that turnaround, and the rest will keep on going higher. As illustrated in 7, for the British speaker, there's a major rise on mail, and then after a comparatively level piece, a further rise on money. So in this sentence in 7, will you mail me my money? Where is the tonic accent? Will you mail me my money? Right. And what am I suggesting in my question? Right, as opposed to? As, as opposed to what? 是用mail的而不是什么? So will you mail me my money or do I have to pick it up myself? Will you mail me my money? So the different stress there has changed what we're asking about. So we can find it very clearly in the Chinese translation. Let's translate the first one. Will you mail me my money? Will you mail me my money? How are you going to translate that? You will mail me my money? Will you mail me my money? 寄给我把钱。钱 is a way of focusing, putting the focus on what is important. And what is something important that happens after a, this is the in Chinese. 把钱,后面必须要怎么样。有两点很重要。中文的把字句, Chinese grammar, everybody write this down. It will, it will come in handy. 把字句,这是把字句。
Why do we use 八字句？你会寄钱给我吗？也可以。That works in Chinese, right? 你会寄钱给我吗 ？That means we weren't really talking about money before. But if I say 你会把钱寄给我吗 ？What's the difference? Yeah, we're marking the object. 八字句通常是 mark 一个 object. 把钱 you're going to take something and do something with it. It puts it in focus. Okay, 他把那个焦点放在钱上面。所以这个钱这现在是议题很重要。And what's going to come after it? There's two things about the verbs that are going to come after. 后面我们需要动词，对不对？这个东西怎么处理 ？Right. So 你会把钱怎么样？ Two important things. Number one is, 你可以这样说吗？嗯，你会把钱寄吗？不可以，这不合文法。What's wrong with it? Huh? 把钱，钱是是受词，问题不在受词。你会把钱寄吗 ？Yeah, you're trying to fi fix this bad sentence, but you have to analyze what you're doing and what the problem is. You just say no, no, no. It's not right. But why? You 会把钱寄吗？寄物动词怎么样 ？There we go. Continue. Okay. First of all, in Chinese, I recommend you don't worry so much about V S O stuff. Don't think so much about that. We're we're talking first of all about information structure, right? And the second thing we're going to talk about in Chinese is syllabicity, just a syllable count. 音节的数量，音节数是有关的，这是很重要的。In Chinese, syllable count contributes to rhythm. In Chinese, there are syllable count constraints. 会要求某一个音节数。So 一个音节是不准的。把信寄，可以吗？把信寄，可以吗 ？No. 把信寄掉可以吗？可以吗？把信寄掉可以吗 ？What's the difference? 反正都是寄。Sherry, you had the right idea. You have to put something after it. But when you got to 及物动词 forget that. Worry about. It. Don't forget. It. Don't don't think of the 及物动词 part. But you have to put something after it. That part was right. Anybody else? 把信寄是不行的 ，but 把信寄掉是可以。Why? Go ahead. Well, not just, 不是偶数 but you have the right idea. It's just you need two, or more. 不是偶数的问题，是说你至少需要两个音节。In Chinese, syllable count is part of the grammar rules. 你们的文法规则里面有包括音节数的规则。所以呢。八字句后面的动词至少需要几个音节？至少两个，三个可以。OK， 把它做起来也可以，三个也可以。可是最起码你需要两个。Alex， it's bizarre， and you speak this language so well. You can't. I took a class in Chinese grammar, so I probably know more than you do. <laughs> I learned this back in 大学 We used we used Zhao Yuan. Okay, I can recommend a book if you really want the whole picture. In the most wonderful book on Chinese grammar ever written, in my opinion, is 中国话的文法 by Zhao Yuan Ren. And it's not Zhao Yuan Ren. <laughs> 有个学生写个仍然的人 Okay, 不是那个人是 Zhao Yuan Ren. If you don't know this 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 way, that a linguist, he's the man I admire most in Chinese linguists linguistics. 这是我我的偶像啊，中国语言学里面，赵元任。Okay, 赵姓赵的赵，元旦的元，任任务的任，赵元任。His book in Chinese he calls 中国话的文法 He wrote it in English. It's called A Grammar of Spoken Chinese. 已经绝版了 It is 绝版很多年了 And I don't know why, because it's simply the greatest book on Chinese grammar ever written, in my opinion. And isn't that funny? We need two syllables or more. 
需要两个音节以上。And that's not the only situation when it happens, but that's the only one I'll talk about now. 你需要两个音节以上。Oh, there you, okay, so you learned something about Chinese. Nobody ever told you that in school, right? And they probably won't. That's why I think they should teach a class on Chinese grammar here in our department. Everybody needs it. There's a second thing with that particular ba zi ju. There's another thing you should know. And this is going to be something about verbs, but it all comes back to phonetics in some ways. So it's worth mentioning. And I think it's pronounced tealik. It's one of those words I use a lot in my research, but I never, I hardly ever say. Tealik and atealik. Tealik means that it has a goal and it can be finished. And atealik means that means it doesn't have a, ne a, a clear beginning or end. Okay? So for example, I'm thinking, is that tealik or atealik? Atelic, it's just a bunch of thought there. I don't have a particular goal and I haven't finished any particular action. That's telic. Okay, it has a goal, it's finished, we're done. So if it is that's a telic kind of a verb. So after ba zi we need telic verbs. Some kind of a telic verb. Now you can find words you'll say, ah, xiang sukai. 把事情想,是不可以,对不对?把事情想一想, is that a good sentence? 我把事情想一想, is that good? To me, it's okay, but not that wonderful. 他终于把这件事情想通了, how's that? Much better, right? You think it's better? All right, because 想通, is that telic or atelic? Atelic. And you can see the origin because ba literally means to take in your hand, right? Yi ba zhua. Ba means to take in your hand. That means something you can hold in your hand and chu li diao. That's the idea of a ba zi ju. I'm going to take this thing, I'm putting it into focus now, and I'm going to take care of it, finish it. All right? So that's something you need to know about. And this, this has to do with emphasis. So a lot of things that we're doing here with intonation, you're going to have to do with grammar in Chinese and there are rules for it. So are you ever, ever going to agree with somebody who says Chinese has no grammar? You never, you should not, okay? Because Chinese has a very, very yanjing grammar. It's very simple, straightforward. I think it's the most elegant grammar in the whole world. That's my personal opinion. I majored in Chinese. I love Chinese. So when you get into it, you'll see Chinese does things so simply and elegantly. Because in Xue Shu, we always look for the simplest, most elegant solution as the best, right? Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is the best. And to me, Chinese do things in a very direct and simple way, an elegant way, and clear, in spite of what everybody says about Chinese. So these are just a few of the rules. Now, in English, we have to do a lot of these things with intonation because we do not have equivalent rules in English. We do it with intonation. Got it? Wasn't it an insight? I mean, that's really a useful thing to know. Um, let's finish this paragraph here. Um, so, will you mail me my money? Uh, that's, uh, are you going to mail it to me or, or do I have to pick it up? Now consider what you do in questions that cannot be answered by yes or no. There are many possible ways of answering. Um, but probably the most neutral thing with a, uh, is with a falling contour starting on the final stressed syllable. For example, what are you doing? What are you doing? The final content word has the tonic accent, the tonic stress, and it falls. That's the general rule, which you should already know from the Shido de Wenzhang. What are you doing? Where are you going? What time is it? It's a pretty reliable rule. We can make the intonation go up, but it has a different meaning. If I say, what time is it? Normally, I'll say, what time is it? And you'll answer, it's 9.20. Or it's 9.40 now, actually. But if I say, what time is it? What does that mean? I'm surprised. I thought I had a lot more time. What time is it? 
That means 我要你重复确认，因为我怕我听错了。Okay, so we do have a rising intonation, but it has an entirely different meaning. Um, let's see. Apparently, the British speaker has instead put the tonic accent very early in the question on when. So,、um, when will you mail me my money? And you can do it both ways. If you look at this example on the top of one twenty-three, when will you mail me my money? 可以 Or when will you mail me my money? 就是我刚刚讲的情况本来应该是 falling has a rising intonation. If it's a W H question, is it usually rising or falling? Falling. falling very good. Very good. And what are the five W H's? Who? What? Where? When? Why? I will get H. How? Who? What? Where? When? Why? How? 就把当歌曲背起来 So when will you mail me my money? When will you mail mail me my money? So 可以 That's kind of a tongue twister. When will you mail me my money? And I'm using intonation to say, 到底什么时候可不可以快一点 And here, when Bruce does it, when will you mail me my money? That means、um, I'm still not clear. Could you please make it clear? You probably said it once, and I didn't get it. Can you repeat it, please? When will you mail me my money? So actually, they're doing different things here. In this chapter, 我嫌它不够细，很多东西它写的不够细 So Take a lot of good notes in class. It should clarify some of these questions. As we saw in three, a small rising intonation occurs in the middle of sentences, typically at the end of an intonational phrase. Another example is given in nine. Again, there's a difference between the British and the American English speaker. The British speaker has a fall followed by a rise in the word winning. The American English speaker has a sharp rise followed by a large fall that levels off at the end. So, when you are winning, I will run away. When you are winning, I will run away. Both of these are okay. When you are winning, I will run away. When you are winning, pause, continuation, rise,、uh, continuation, rise, pause. That's the correct order. I will run away. When you are winning, 它是特别强调在那个时候就在那个时候 Both are fine. They have different emphases. A list of items. All right, 就是列举的那种音调 and we may have covered that before. So. Things in a list, they'll go up, 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 and down. And there's another variation of that. They'll go up, 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 and down. So red, white, and blue. Red, white, yellow, and blue. So it's a variation. So 两个都可以第二个是稍微有点变化 And so we knew Anna, Lenny, Mary, and Nora. Exact same thing. And the American English does pretty much the same. Next page. Any questions? Note that yes/no questions can often be reworded so that they fit into this rising pattern, signaling that there is more to come. The British speaker has a rise on money, followed by a regular sentence ending with a fall on or not. The American English speaker has a rise starting on money and continuing through the or not, which again drops into a creaky voice at the end. This final fall is not very evident on the recording, but it's there. So the general impression is of rising intonation at the end. So I'm just going to perform them. You can listen to your own CD. Will you mail me my money or not? That's the first one. Will you mail me my money or not? Now, what feeling does that question give you? Is he very patient? No. 你到底寄不寄给我？到底 You need a 到底 in there for the Chinese. And the American says, "Will you mail me my money or not?" But basically, it's the same thing here. It's useful to distinguish between two kinds of rising intonation in one, which typically occurs in yes/no questions. There's a large upward movement of pitch in the other, the continuation rise that usually occurs in the middle of the sentence.、Uh, in the in the other, the continuation rise that usually occurs in the middle of sentences. There is a smaller upward movement, and that's what we call singing the little song. Okay, if you do this, I'll be happy. If you do this, this. We've got a tonic stress going high, goes down, and we have a continuation rise. And here he's talking about yes, go on.、Mm. Let's see. In the other, these two intonations often are often used contrastively. Thus, a low rising intonation on an utterance means that there is something more to come. That's the continuation rise we we're just talking about. 
There's a slightly rising intonation in the utterances 12 and 13. And that's, we're asking a question. These are the kinds of utterances one makes when listening to someone telling a story. He says they're different, but actually they're the same principle. So, I ran into Mary yesterday. Yes. Okay? I ran into Mary yesterday. Yes. Or we could say, and. And that's also a continuation rise. It means I want to hear the rest of the story. And if you want an example of it, go to the mini conversations in freshman English. Freshman English, mini conversations. I have tickets to the Elton John concert, remember? And the girl says, and? What's she saying? Yes, she's saying, are you going to ask me out? And do you think he does? Well, <laughs> go to the conversation. Actually, he does. So you can hear a pretty good example of that. I'd like to hear the rest of the story intonation. It's basically the same thing, but we don't have a tonic stress there. So I like this, but not that. The tonic is, that's the continuation rise. And then when we say and, there's no tonic there, right? Mayo tonic. So that's why we don't have that high pitch. That's really the only two difference between the two. It's like a chapter, I think that intonation studies in the U.S. are still quite weak. And the reason I've given before is a, a lot of people have not done enough comparisons with other languages and heard people do it wrong. If you hear people doing it wrong, you will quickly figure out what the rule is because they're not doing it right. You have to tell them why it's wrong. That's how I got what I learned about English intonation is by listening to Taiwan English, I think, no, that's not quite right. And the students go, oh, there's a rule, and then they got it right. Okay? So hearing mistakes is a blessing. It's a gift. Remember that. Mistakes are always a gift. There are many things you will never, ever learn unless you hear a mistake. Mistakes are often the only insight you will get into something. So appreciate every mistake that comes by, but learn from your mistakes. If there is a larger rise in pitch, as in 14 and 15, there is a change in meaning to something more like, did you say yes? Did you say go on? The British speaker uses more than 75% of, of his full range, and the American speaker uses an even greater range. It should be noted, however, that people are not entirely consistent in the way they use this difference in intonation. It depends on how excitable and how excited they are, right? So, yes, I'm trying to be calm. And then here, yes. And if I'm getting impatient, it'll get more and more exaggerated. So often it has to do with your emotional state. Both rising and falling intonations can occur within the same tonic accent. If someone tells you something that surprises you, you might have a distinct fall rise on the tonic syllable, followed by a further rise on the remainder of the intonational phrase. Both speakers in 16 follow this pattern. So um, your mom will marry a lawyer and your mom will marry a lawyer? I thought that Mary was going to marry a lawyer. Because you realize, Mama? Mama? Okay, so your mom will marry a lawyer. Your mom? Your mom will marry a lawyer. There's our tonic, a deep drop and then turning back up. Uh, the English and the, the British and the American are about the same. There are also distinct intonation patterns one can use when answering, addressing, or calling someone. The answer to a question such as, who is that over there, is shown in 17. And then the British speaker dot dot dot, we'll skip that, look at 17. So, um, on page 126, we can have Laura, Laura. That's a mom calling her kid, or you're calling your children in a crowd. Um, and then we have Laura, Laura, that's less calling out to them. It's just sort of gainila. And actually, we should listen to the CD for this one because they have their own ideas of what they should sound like. So let's listen. Hang on. All right, so um, statement of the name. What's your name? Laura. Laura, right? That's one way of doing it. And addressing Laura is Laura, Laura. And calling from a distance, Laura. 
That's what they're describing here in 17, 18, and 19. Um, we can sum up many differences in intonation by referring to the different ways in which a name can be said, particularly if the name is long enough to show the pitch curve reasonably fully. 名字要一定要有一定的长度才能听到这个intonation怎么样那个展现。um, curves 20 through 24 show different pronunciations of the name Amelia. 20 is a simple statement equivalent to her name is Amelia. So 20, Amelia. Everyone? Amelia. Amelia. Good. 21 is the question equivalent to, to, did you say Amelia? So that would be Amelia? Good. And um, 22 is the form with the in continuation rise, which might be used when addressing Amelia, indicating that it's her turn to speak. So, 该你讲话了, Amelia, Amelia, mm -hmm. and 23 is a question expressing surprise equivalent to, was it really Amelia who did that? Amelia? 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 Where's that joy? I want the defang on which syllable? And me is the stress syllable. So stress 就是会展现这个转弯的地方这个 tonic syllable 的这些变化. So Amelia, Amelia, and Amelia, and then Amelia, it was you. And then we have the next one. Um, let's see, 23 is a question uh, expressing surprise. And then 24 is the form for a strong reaction reprimanding Amelia, that means scolding her. Amelia. Amelia. It sounds like you're talking to a dog who's something done something bad. <laughs> okay. Amelia. Sometimes we use this jokingly. So if she said a bad word, Amelia. So sometimes we do this sarcastically. Amelia, you should be ashamed of yourself. All right, should we try all those again? Amelia. 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 Okay, so the important thing is you need to know the stress syllable because that's where all the action takes place. That's where the changes take place. Do you have it? One of the most important points is that intonation cannot be as neatly specified as other aspects of speech. Now they say that, and that is true to some extent, but as you read in the Shida article, those articles are pretty fast and hard. And if you know enough rules, you can figure it out pretty well. Adding on what we all know about emotion, because emotion is universal, not just among humans, but among animals. Many animals can sense it immediately and very accurately because they are processed in the old part of our brain which we share with other animals. Um, by the way, you know the movie My Fair Lady, right? And you know that there's a lot in there about phonetics and pronunciation. Did you know that Professor Ladefogut was the consultant for that movie? You knew that, okay. So that's an important thing to know. He's very, he was very proud of that, rightly so. He did the consulting for that movie. Um, Okay, it says it can't be specified as neatly and tidily, but in fact there are rules. And if as students you learn those rules, you will know what's going on. You can do many variations on the rules from what we know as humans, that's universal. But once you, there are rules and they definitely help. And they are very, quite reliable rules. So it's not as fuzzy as they make it sound here. So this is, in my opinion, a chapter that could use some strengthening. English has been described mainly by considering phonemic contrasts. We have noted that there are 22 consonants in most forms of English and a specific number of vowels in each accent. Each of the contrasting vowels and consonants has certain phonetic properties. Contrast and intonation are more difficult to pin down. So he, he's saying that But it's harder to do with intonation. Usually an intonational phrase the last, in an intonational phrase, the last stress syllable that conveys the new information is the tonic syllable. We know that, and that's extremely important. It has a falling pitch unless it's part of a sentence in which there is another intonational phrase to follow. continuation rise, or at least the lack of a final fall. Questions that can be answered by yes or no usually have a rising intonation 
and one that's larger than the continuation rise. Con questions beginning with a question word such as who, what, where, when, why, and how usually have a falling pitch, but intonation is highly colored by individual variation. But that's one of the things that makes speech so much fun, is everybody's quirks, everybody's little funny habits, the way they express themselves. You can do a lot of variations on intonation that express your own individuality. It's much more affected by the speaker's mood and attitude to the topic being discussed than are the vowels and consonants that make up words in the discussion. So there's a lot more emotion that goes into intonation than into the vowels and consonants. In short, that's what he's saying. Okay, next part we're going to be talking about Toby, and I'm telling you now, we are not going to be tested on Toby. We are not going to be tested on Toby. I just want you to read through it yourself, that they have these different ways of marking high pitches, low pitches, and um, nuclear pitch accents, and boundary tones. So read through it yourself. Another thing that they use, which is quite useful, and it's a lot clearer and easier to learn, is breaks. Because Toby means tones and breaks indices. So tones, just a pitch, bell pitch. It's a way of marking the intonation of a sentence with just, some, just a few symbols, letters and asterisks and so forth and so on. And you can also mark breaks, and you can mark them according to how long they are. 长一点的break就是一个高一点的数字. So read that yourself. We're not going to cover that in class. You will not be tested on it. Toby is useful, but I strongly recommend learning it from a different source. 因为我觉得这上面是有一些confusing. 这是我个人的感觉. I'll give you an example of why I think that. At the top of 129, you see where it says Amelia. Amelia? And you see where it has the IPA? So Amelia, they have a low star, that's the tonic pitch, the tonic accent. Amelia. It's high. And how many percentage is a boundary marker? But Amelia the uh is a bialda. There's a schwa, but how did they mark it in Toby? Nothing. Nothing. That's the problem. We need to know whether it's high or low. So it could be Amelia or Amelia. It doesn't tell you. So that's one of the things I find confusing about the system. I think all these things need to be marked. We need to know where the starting pitch is. That's just an example. So I think Toby is certainly useful, and you'll probably have to, you will need to learn it if you continue in phonetics but I advise learning it from another source. Um, just one last thing before we go, and we have finished the chapter. We'll have finished it very soon. Um, here we're talking about something called downdrift. This is on page 130. That means at the beginning of a paragraph, I said this in a different class, we start on a high pitch with a lot of energy. The further we go in the paragraph, the less energy we have and we go down lower and lower. The pitch goes lower. This happens on the sentence level. The first part of the sentence is high energy and we have a lower pitch towards the end, even on the tonic syllable. The down drift or the down stepping will push down the tone. So keep that in mind. That's the important part of 130. You have to read it yourself. That at the end of a sentence, our energy kind of peters out. Peter, that's not a strong language, by the way. So our peters out. Just a mama hui and it happens at the end of a paragraph when we start a new topic. We're full of energy and it gets high again. So this slow moving down is called downdrift. And going down step by step, we call that downstepping. And the example they have here is one that we've seen before. Mary's younger brother wanted 50 chocolate peanuts. Listen. Mary's younger brother wanted 50 chocolate peanuts. It's getting lower and lower. That's downdrift. Down drift. And it's also called declination. Mm. And that's it. We finished chapter five. The bell has rung. Anybody have questions? Don't forget to watch the video. Don't forget to look at page 20, the web page 20, about syllable structure. And you need to hand in your exercises on this chapter when? Next Monday, right? 
And if you have any overdue assignments, make sure you hand those in. We are going to start on chapter four next time. And if you're really gasping for breath, I suggest you consider a study group. Read the chapters, they're not really that long. Read them in a circle, one by one. Make sure you understand everything. It will definitely help you in the final. Okay, questions? We are done for today. We'll see you on Wednesday.